Today I have both a friend and a peer, I guess, and someone that I've known a really long time. Uh, this is Navid Usman. He's located in Chicago. I've known him for, uh, what, has it been 10 plus years? Longer than that, right? Mm -hmm. So we've met in 2001 working for a company called uh, Wildcard Systems, and we collaborated on a lot of different projects for some Fortune 100 clients, Bank of America, U.S. Bank, and um, had a few years of working together, and then we kind of parted ways, and he moved back to Chicago, and I'm here in Orlando, and um, have kind of stayed in touch and um, want to talk through with him how to design a website that meets business goals. This is a, a big question of what are business goals as it relates to websites and how to set business goals. And Navid is the perfect person to kind of talk through that. So uh, Navid, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody your, uh, your background and how you arrived. Uh, you're the partner at Solid Digital and mm -hmm. maybe walk through how you got to where you're at today. Absolutely. So thank you for letting me expose a little bit about what I know today. Um, so yeah, my name is Naveed. I am one of the partners at Solid Digital. Uh, Solid Digital is a full service marketing agency, design agency, development agency. Um, we work with B2B companies, brands specifically that are in the healthcare, manufacturing and entertainment sectors. Um, inside those uh, different categories. There are companies that, like Redbox, for example, um, there could be companies in the manufacturing sector, like, well, I can't say, because uh, there's, there's a couple of them that we have NDAs for. Um, but ultimately, these are guys that are doing some really cool things with um, IoT, they're doing some things with mobile, they're doing some things with television, and they're doing some things with web. So it's really allowed us to experience kind of branch out away from just doing websites and really focus in on some new and interesting things that are happening with devices. Um, but what we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis is we work with them, we consult with them, and then we help them build these products or evolve what they currently have in place. So those are the two major ways that we'll help them. It's uh, Solid Digital is a uh, first and foremost a production house. It's one that we have a lot of design uh, and development and um, project managers and account managers, all of, the, all of the real true players that are involved to make these things come to life. So it's a, it's a really great place for uh, companies to, that don't essentially have a team or a series of resources and they need those experts and they can essentially use us for that time to either be in a project or a program setting to get them to where they need to get. That's great. And so you haven't been with Solid Digital for, what, two years now? You kind of, you know, you had your own agency for a while, had your own client base, so you worked really hard for to grow that, and you just, this is a new initiative for you, right? It is. So prior to the Solid Digital, I had uh, an agency that I had for about 10 years, and in it, we, it was a slow evolution uh, in terms of um, collecting clients, and then serving clients, and then um, that client told another client, sort of so on and so forth. Um, so what, where we evolved from essentially is uh, doing websites uh, with Usman Group, which we did a lot of the front facing, a lot of the uh, strategy, a lot of the user experience, as well as the front end development. So really the front side of the world is where we played. Solid Interactive was another agency that we partnered with regularly, and they did a lot of the heavy lifting technology types of implementations. And so when you're dealing with custom, it just made sense that these two worlds needed to have a, a, a better footprint or more integration with one another. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to essentially create Solid Digital, which is uh, uh, the pairing of these three worlds, one in, on the design and development side, and then the other more on the programming and the technology side. So that way we have this sort of end-to-end -end experience for customers. Um, so in its current form, we're about one year old. As of uh, December 31st, I believe we'll have that one year uh, completion as a, as, a, as a single unit. That's great, man. I'm, you know I'm excited for you. It sounds like such a, a great next step for you in your career, and so uh, couldn't be more happy for you. And I'm excited to follow, follow along over the next couple of years. So let's go ahead and dive into this, because you've got such a dynamic experience with working with clients specifically on website initiatives and now it's like you're branching out and maybe focusing on, on other digital 
type of engagements. Um, and you've worked with a variety of clients from small to big. I mean, I know you freelanced for a while, uh, just like I did way back in the day, um, probably working for some mom and pa shops that uh, had a couple checks bounce here and there, um, all the way to some, some bigger clients, right, that, um, you know, you're in charge of um, million dollar budgets, marketing budgets. So let's let's kind of take both of our wisdom and our experience and talk through this this concept of a website and sort of business goals, right? Because I, I know we talk a lot here on Protofuse about understanding that a website is is more than kind of a pretty interface. I mean, we're we're kind of way past that when it comes to the website world, right? Where we, we need to to build a successful website that's going to generate leads and, and create revenue and create awareness. Like you just have to have a different mindset than what you did 10, 15 years ago. So let's talk through this idea of like how to approach business goals, right? Um, as it, as it relates to a website. So, um, maybe the first question I'll throw at you is, is what exactly are business goals as it relates to a website? Let's start with something simple. Absolutely. It's one of the hardest questions that um, a, a client is is posed to answer. It's almost very confrontational when, um, you know, you're walking into a situation and you're saying, well, what are your goals? It, 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 it's the way this del it's the delivery, essentially, of how to peel that out. Um, because essentially what they have are objectives, not necessarily goals. How, how I, I would define a goal is something like a smart goal, something that's measurable, right, and attainable and realistic and timely. So those things to me are what I try to translate. So when a customer says, usually, I'm going to want to increase my leads, I'm going to want to increase my conversions, those are some great objectives, right, to say that those are the first um, ideas that, that at least gives us a way to sort of peel into. Um, and then from that conversation, I want to then understand, well, what sort of strategies and then tactics come into it. So it's almost like imagine the three boxes or three categories. I like to start off with objectives. And then in the next column, I'll start off with, okay, what's the strategy to support that objective? And then the next column next to that is what are the tactics that are needed in order to support that strategy? Hmm. So one builds on top of the other. And I do it in a visual way for them or for clients so that we're all on the same page. We're in the actual room together, or if it's, a, if it's a screen share, they can see the screens as we're talking because there's something really powerful about putting something on the board or something that everybody can see visually because mm -hmm. it allows them to focus on what is the objective. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to be talking around in circles around what's the objective. They're going to get confused about what the strategy is going to be, and then they might even confuse the tactic for the strategy. Right. So. Right. And, and so this, this framework allows them to really live in three different quadrants. Hmm. You know, we, that's how I would do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, the strategy before tactics, right? It's kind of maybe a little bit overused in the business world, um, but it, it is still very powerful. So I love this idea that you're talking about with the three quadrants, right? The objectives versus the strategy versus the tactics. So just a follow-up question to you are those is that a linear process would be the first part and then the second part would be what's an example objective versus a strategy absolutely so um it, it's a bit of a linear process i like to try and follow that framework as best as possible because um, that objective really grounds them to the next conversation which is strategy and then tactics so uh, christina halverson she's a content strategist super super sharp in our industry um, she had this really great story um, that stuck with me for quite some time and that is um, think about objectives as if you're say a bear and you're hungry so your objective is you're hungry and you want to get food and that's your objective so um, the strategy would then be then I'm gonna be a bear and I'm just gonna go waddle down to the to the river and because I think there's fish there Do so that's the waddle, strategy. by the way <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, after, after they've opened themselves up from a big hibernation, they're hungry. Right. Yeah, sure, true. They're gonna, walk over the, they're gonna walk on over to the river, and and they figure the strategy is I'm just gonna go where the fish are, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the strategy. Mm -hmm. And then the tactic is he, you know, I'm gonna you know open my mouth, stick my mouth into the river, and maybe I'll catch a fish. Mm -hmm. And so each one of those has to have that sort of touch point. One has to build on top of the other. Otherwise, if you're if you don't have the strategy right, say you know your tactic is you're in the middle of the woods now, 
mm-hmm. and you've opened up your in your mouth and you're trying to catch fish but mm-hmm. there's no fish there because you're in the middle of the woods and so no matter how many tactics you might have to do it's never going to be successful because the strategy was not in, you know in, in play or in, in sync gotcha gotcha i love that that's that's easy to remember too it does um, the bear, you know the bear's thing always stuck with me and and, and i'll tell you that i'll give 100 percent credit to her because she mm-hmm. actually you know had stated this in a really smart way mm-hmm. which then stuck with me as well and ever since then it's been helpful to translate that to clients as well because it's the same questions that come out too is to say mm-hmm. well define an objective and define a strategy and define a tactic right right and so that happens organically so when when i've got that three up on the board or three that's happening i'll try to jot down those things in the bucket of tactics okay great well social media might be the way for us to to, to release that information mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let's put that and put a pin on it and put it to the side um but let's keep you know so that way i'm trying to organize their thoughts as we're as we're talking through this right. yeah and, the, and you hit on a good point too the the whiteboards or piece of paper or just getting something written down is is so powerful it just helps move the meeting along it, it if, at least from my perspective you, know, you probably agree it just you you see the light bulbs actually physically turn on as you're looking at the client they seem to be more engaged and so yeah i would I recommend that too. If you're you're sitting down, you're trying to write business goals down for our website. Like, don't just talk about it. Don't just email back and forth. Like, get in a, get in a room, start writing it down. Whiteboard would probably be ideal. I love whiteboards, so and I, and I know you do too. So so give me um give me a quick example from a website perspective. I know you've worked with a lot of different clients with a lot of different websites. Like, give me an example of an objective and a strategy and then a tactic just to kind of put it to context. Okay. Um, I'll just peel out maybe something that's been most recent that we've been working with. Um, one of the objectives, so we're working with a company that is in the world of autism and they're, they're, they, they're a center essentially that helps children with autism um, basically learn and cope and behave properly into the world. Um, it's not a daycare center and it's not a place that you go to um, essentially drop your kids off it's a place that you actually want your child with autism to um, to learn some of the, the tips and techniques of what to do and, and, and survive in society. Mm. Uh, there's mental triggers um, that they just don't have or filters that they just don't have. And so they have to learn all this stuff. Um, so the objective essentially for this particular company was, one, we need a website that can do two things. One, we need the way that they're structured is that they have – um, a one-to-one conversation or a one-to-one pairing is probably the better word for a student to teacher. Mm. So that's how they work. Mm. Um, because of the rules that have happened in Medicare in Indiana and Ohio and Kentucky, they've opened up the world a little bit in terms of Medicare, allowing for children with autism to be accepted into these facilities or into these clinics. That's opened up a whole new market. So there's more kids lined up now than there are teachers or there are nurses or ABTs is what they call them. Mm-hmm. Um, or RBTs, sorry. Um, so RBTs are, are, are nurses essentially that have learned the art and the craft of dealing with children and teaching children the skills required. Mm-hmm. So the objective is to, um, in twofold, one is to continue attracting more and more parents to come to the centers and, and enroll the children. Mm-hmm. But the other dual objective is to get more nurses to either become nurses because they don't come off the shelf. Mm-hmm. You have to have train these people. So you have to you have to show that there's a career path mm-hmm. to becoming somebody of a nurse to be to, to want to do this. Mm-hmm. So that that's the objective for this particular website is to develop this website so that it appeals to the audience. Right. And right. These two types of individuals. Gotcha. Recruit and um, um, acquisition of customers, or, or, or in this case, you know, uh, kiddos, who they call them. Gotcha. Uh, so the strategy um, is to use um, different types of, well, we know that the website is going to be an area that people are going to come to get more information. Mm-hmm. So the strategy is to develop content and enough content that's going to uh, explain to somebody in, in a nursing capacity the benefits of becoming a nurse, what's in it for them, and then essentially how they're going to make an impact in the world. 
So that's, you know, the, the idea to use the web in that respect. Mm -hmm. There are different channels we're going to use. It's more well, like social media channels to help influence as well as drive engagement and allow for events to occur. They'll have a lot of open houses and things like that, not only for, for, for kiddos, but also for potential nurses. So the strategy is to use the website and then de develop these different channels as well as these different content touch points that the website as well as social media will, will actually hold. Um, the tactic then down to the, to that level is mm -hmm. well, we're going to need a website, mm -hmm. right? Need social media mm -hmm. to be able to do that. We're going to need to optimize our pages for specific phrases like autism in Indiana or in Indianapolis, things like that. Mm -hmm. So those are the tactics that are going to help support that the strategy and the objectives. Gotcha. I love it. And do you put all this down then in a document, I assume nicely laid out, easily scannable, you know, just to make sure that it's everyone's on the same page and the client understands exactly what it is. Cause you know how it is going from a whiteboard to yeah. conversation to, you know, the trickle down effect of actually making sense of it, you know, especially with me with bad, bad handwriting, you know, on a whiteboard, <laughs> yeah, no, I've, need a I've translator, seen. you know, with the chicken scratch. So yeah, I would assume probably some sort of document, right. Is probably what you would recommend too. I, you know, it, it's hard on the document side because um, one is, we we go, we went through a lot of research on, on for this particular case. Mm -hmm. um, and in it, we were able to collect uh, a lot of information. We had to distill it. Mm -hmm. uh, we put it into some kind of format that is really more sort of leadership friendly or executive friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to condense it down to 10, 15 slides. Okay. And so it's right, a slideshow. It's, it's a slideshow I'd like to bring it down to because wow. document, they, they're not going to read it. They're just going to say it like just gloss it and say, got it. Right. Right. You know, there, there's obviously a lot of those artifacts that they can go back and look at and go through, mm -hmm. which we've developed mm -hmm. because but the documentation is so heavy and dense that at that point, really it's hard for people, especially if you're dealing with different teams, they want it quick and fast and understanding or understood fairly yeah. quickly. So slides is the best way to distill it, give it to them and then that can help we can help talk through those things when we talk to leadership or or whomever is on the team so that they're not uh, mired in all of these really intense details gotcha. that came out you know love it yeah i hadn't thought about you know we we have a strategy document that gets pretty dense and um pretty thorough sometimes it can be 60 some pages right now a little bit different you know for us we're walking through a client you know, seven, eight weeks of this process and they've seen every step along the way. And the document is more of just sort of cataloging everything mm -hmm. that we talk about and all the decisions that we made as for a reference for, for subsequent phases. But, mm -hmm. um, the slideshow idea is interesting where it's almost like I can see even for us, a mini step where you say, Hey, at a very, very high level, if you just want kind of an executive summary, check out these six slides or these 10 slides you know, which would be a lot more powerful, a lot more digestible. So that's, that's an interesting, um, interesting point of view. I like that. So, all right, so let's move this, let's move this on. Why, why do we do all this stuff? Why do we do, why do we have all these conversations? Why do we force ourselves to um, make this documentation and have an agreement? And, and, you know, both you and I have been around the block a number <laughs> of times to, to know exactly why we do this, right, as agency owners. But yeah. why, why is a company, right, um, no matter who they hire, who they work with, whether it be a freelancer or they do it internally or they hire an agency, like why do we need to set business goals as it relates to the website? Like why is this so very important? Why not just go ahead and jump into design and start putting, you know, pen to paper and putting pixels on the screen and making pretty interfaces? Like, and again, I know that you and I know this, but, you know, let's just talk through why, why do we even do this? I, you know, I, I kind of want to step back for a second because you've an, you kind of answered the question a little bit in in, in that reveal of <laughs> you know, why why do these things and and one of it in some cases is to validate are we all on the same page because you know we as as partners or an outside agency uh, much like you guys we don't we're not cut in the same way as they are we don't we're not in the same room in some cases all the time with them. And, and so we do want to validate that. Are we all on the same page together? So I think having that sort of debrief as well as these, um, um, these distillations of the presentation, not only allows everybody on the same 
uh, we're all on the same team experience. But also when we start talking to the designers or developers or the internet marketers or the content writers or the videographers, all of these different players that are part of this, this, this orchestra, um, it, when we distill it down for them really simply, they get it. And, and that way that they're all kind of singing on the same, you know, same page and try to make it simple for them. Um, the objectives are good because then we can go back to those objectives as a business and say, look, you said this was the problem. We figured this was the way to solve it. You agreed this was these were the ways to solve it. And so this was the path forward. So that um, I think it's it, it provides that form of alignment. But I think it's also allowing this communication to occur within the different teams that this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And going back to those objectives, because if there's a major thing that starts talking about, um, I don't know, somebody says a feature or a client says, oh, you really need a feature on, you know, location finder. Mm -hmm. And we go back to that and say, look, that's not really part of the objective right now is mm -hmm. is doing a location finder. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, actually, it is, because remember, we're trying to do that. So, you know, it, it sparks those conversations mm -hmm. uh, and, and opens up some things or closes down things right. that don't really fall into the to the objectives now where it could burn us is in scope because then that's the next thing that says mm -hmm. well you didn't pay for that <laughs> you know i know this was a great idea that we talked about and thought about just now mm -hmm. but it's not something that we actually we we prepared to do and then in those cases it's fine because you can do a change order and and you can be on your way but i think what this what these collaborations are really healthy about doing is opening it up so that we're brainstorming and building the project along the way. Yeah. So it's, it's it really help, holds both sides accountable, both the agency to actually execute based upon the objectives and the strategy and the tactics, right? Because they can't get off the hook because it's been agreed upon. But then also on the client side, you know, as a business owner, you know, or, or you know, CMO, you're held accountable because you kind of all agreed upon what you want to do, what the objectives were at the onset. So even though an idea may come up during the design phase or the developmental phase, or you know, as you're diving into the internet marketing aspect of it, it's okay. So I always can be, you know, for us, we always say, hey, phase two, you know, we, we can do this, but you know, let's, let's get what we, what we originally planned out the door and working for you. And, you know, a website's never done. It's a living, breathing thing. It's, you know, you need to continually support it, add new features, you know, be thinking about, you know, data that you've collected through the measurement process. And what is that data telling you? So, um, yeah, what I'm hearing from you is really about accountability, right? Yeah. There, there's an accountability factor to, to the objectives. But, you know, I, I also remember the days when we didn't have to do that. I remember when when we were building websites way back in the early days where it was just fun to build these things, right? I mean, if you think about some of the, the artists that we looked up to, um, I think it was Too Advanced and those kinds of guys. Yeah, Eric Jordan. Just, yeah, they would do these amazing just flash sites or just amazing just works of art, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there really was an objective other than can we make it? Can it can it be achieved? Can we do it? Do we want to spend the time in putting our craft together? Yeah. And those were fun days and those were fun times. And, <laughs> and, uh, and just as a disclaimer for people that are watching this, both Navid and I were responsible for a lot of those flash intros <laughs> that you saw on sites were skip intro, skip intro. Yeah, that was yeah. you and I creating those. We apologize. We're sorry for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but but the, the what if, I think, was a really great thing that happened mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if businesses have or, or you know, business clients essentially are going to have that appetite for a lot of discovery. Right. And so having those business objectives um, gets everybody back on the same page. It allows them to see that we are responsible and that we can um, have some fun and play, but uh, under a set, certain set of parameters. Right, right. Okay, so let's talk through, let's say someone watching this doesn't have a big budget for that discovery and for that strategy and planning phase, right? And they just want to build a smart website. They, you know, they, they want to approach it. They want to get the ball moving. They don't, um, you know, they, they would love to have had the website done yesterday, which, you know, we've heard a lot from uh, our clients, but they just want to get the kind of ball, the ball rolling. What are some good questions that they can ask themselves 
right? Yep. Some very, very basic, simple questions that they can sort of bring up to their team members, to their peers, um, and just kind of start wrestling with um, in that initial brainstorming meeting, right? So let's say they've made the decision to redesign their website. They're all sitting around a conference room table and either they hired a freelancer or an agency or they're doing it you know, internally or however they're kind of piecing things together. What are some smart questions that they can ask to get the ball rolling? Sure. Um, so we have a project planner on our website that um, people can download. Um, that's one way that get the ball rolling. And there's a series of questions. It's a word document essentially that asks a ton of questions and they can start to use it in a, in a group format and, and start thinking about it that way. Um, so there are more specific questions, but I think on a more general, broader level, I think there are three major things that, you know, someone will, would want to ask and zoom in on essentially. And that is, what do we want to do? So what are the objectives? So what do we want to do here? Um, what do we believe? I think is another area that I think we this is, is a good opportunity since you're doing some some refreshing here. But what do we believe? And I think that's going to pull out some of the brand attributes. Um, it's going to understand why are we not only doing this, but what are off limits? Like mm -hmm. what are the things that we think that you know we're not prepared to do or we're not we don't really are good at? Mm -hmm. um, and then who are we at this point? Because as, as companies evolve, they they tend to forget what they slowly have become. Mm -hmm. and they may have started out as this, but then they've kind of reframed themselves or repositioned themselves to be that. So um, those are three core questions to ask, mm -hmm. I think, as a company. But there are plenty of other suggestions around getting a little bit deeper. And some of them are going to be what, like, who is our audience and what do we want to say to them and what do they care about and what are their motivations and what's the job to be done that they would like to be able to achieve. How can we match that up with what we have in place? And is there actually some congruency between what we have and what they want? Mm -hmm. Love that. So there's, there's plenty of, of, of sort of questions that they can ask, but I think the three major ones would be like, you know, what do we want to do? What do we believe? And who are we today? Right. So would you, <laughs> if you're still listening in on this, the questions you don't want to be asking are things like what what is our design going to look like <laughs> what content management system are we going to use even though that might be a high high level you know technical yeah. requirement that you may need to sort of answer internally you know but um anything creative and technical feature-based type of stuff like you're kind of backing it off of that and just kind of easing into it with some of these high level questions which are really great and really important to answer yeah, and and something will be revealed from those things, right? It's because as they the onion will continue to get peeled and peeled and peeled, mm -hmm. and I think that's what the the beauty of of working with firms like yours or ours is, is because we're there to help guide that process mm -hmm. and actually unveil and unravel that stuff. Because they can go online and try and answer this stuff for themselves, or they can try and do a lot of these things for themselves. Mm -hmm. but where it comes to in terms of the service and the guidance and the expertise that we bring is the things that we've learned from other places and how to do this right. and, and hold them accountable for this stuff because yeah. you're paying somebody to do this and guess what? They're more invested in doing it with you than, than if they just try to do it for free or themselves. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about that process. I know you did the, the three boxes, which is a very practical and visual way of kind of approaching it, you know, with the objectives, the strategy and the tactics. Um, but what are, you know, what are some critical activities aside from that? Maybe if we go deeper into each one of those squares, like what are maybe some critical activities during that step that you would take a client through to ensure that the website is hitting its goals, whatever the goals are established at the front end, right? So, I mean, this could be anything from audience definition. I don't know if you personally get into that, you and your agency solid gets into that during the objectives or the strategy phase, but you know, what are some tangible practical things that they can do as they're kind of kicking off a strategy? Um, well, getting to talk to their customers, I think would be an extremely important exercise. Um, it's one where I've seen a lot of companies reveal and, and just become just befuddled by what they thought they knew of their customers. Mm. Sometimes they haven't done a survey in a while, so I think doing something like that would help to reveal 
some of the things that they should be thinking about, talking about, and catering to. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a pretty quick thing to do right off the bat. So I think it's a big activity and it's a big reveal as to what, what their customers and various different types of customers, right? Not the ones that oh, love you, but also the ones that didn't buy from you potentially or the ones right. that are continuing you. So it, it's very uh, insightful to see because from that, that could also develop the type of persona that you're going to want to build this website out for, you know? So that could be a, a really quick, tangible way to to get that that bit of information. And then when you're going down to a user testing experience, you can you can use those same sort of variables or, or considerations um, to say, did, did, did we appeal to this type of base? Did they actually, are we seeing a, a type of uptick from um, our you know, signups or memberships or purchase mm-hmm. power purchases um, as a result of us um, adhering to or catering to some of the major concerns that they had. Maybe they had thought price was a big concern and so they weren't ready to buy just yet. So mm-hmm. they needed a little bit more freshness or more, mm-hmm. uh, you know, customer service oriented understanding of how you're going to support their product before they make the purchase. So, you know, there could be that type of motivation that needs to be instilled. You can test that out after the site's been built and seeing if that made the positive impact or not. This idea of actually reaching out to your customers, people that have paid you money to get (laughs) insight on what they want your website to do or the type of information that they need on your website. Like this stuff is like so powerful. I don't even think organizations understand how powerful it is. Like 10 years ago, I didn't understand the why you did this. I'm like, hey, an organization should understand exactly why, um, the exact type of information that they need, they need to provide on the site, you know, uh, how it should be structured, different features and so forth. And then I kind of just realized over time and through wisdom and through multiple engagements that like it's, it could completely redefine someone's mindset because you bring so much bias into your own website, right? I know that I do that with Protofuse's website. I know you probably do that as well. And you get so close to something that um, you start to kind of rewrite history and you start to believe what you want to believe and just doing a little bit of research to reach out to the people that are actually using the website could completely redefine how you approach your site. Um, I, I've seen this time and time again. So I, I think that's brilliant advice, like talking to end users, which is the core, right, of user personas and, and audience research is, um, you know, don't bring that bias in, like actually talk to the people that are using your website and, and need those features just to confirm maybe that, you know, you, you know what you're talking about or, you know, maybe introduce a new line of thinking. So I'm, I'm with you on that. Yep. It's a reflection essentially of, again, why they would want to use someone like our firms because we are essentially holding up a mirror and we can ask those dumb questions <laughs> because they, we're, you know, we don't know. Right. And so um, that helps us. And that's another reason why they would want to use a firm like ours because mm-hmm. there is no way that someone can do this on their own. Sure. Because, like it's like trying to chew your own teeth. It's really <laughs> I've never heard that before, by the way, but it makes sense. <laughs> All right, so let's 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 fast forward. This is the last question. We got to be wrapping up here. Don't want to make this too long. I could talk about this topic for for hours with you. So post launch, right? They're, they they spent a lot of time and energy and money, kind of at the forefront, setting the objectives, setting the strategy, setting the tactics. They go through the design, the development, the content curation process, the organization. I mean, just like all the work that has to be done, they launch. How do they know if their website has reached those goals that they set out at the very beginning stages? Like how, you know, is it through analytics? Is it through a, like a a qualitative sort of way, quantitative sort of way? Um, How do you approach that? Sure, so right before the site launches or, or even during the discovery process as going back to the objectives, that's where we're already, we've collected all that information. And then part of what a good firm is going to do, like experienced consultants as well, is to translate those objectives to actual tangible key performance indicators. You can use things like Google Analytics, or you can use things like Hotjar, or you can use things that are off the shelf, like any other e-commerce you know, metrics, uh, to, to try and peel out, okay, did we actually do what we said we we're going to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the data then helps to support that. 
So how can, and this is where it becomes challenging because sometimes how it's, it's maybe challenging to, 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 to understand what customer satisfaction survey scores would going to be. Right. Uh, because Google Analytics can only go so far, so it's not going to be able to do that. And, and so, you know, and rather than trying to say, oh, wow, they spent 25 minutes on your web page or <laughs> the bounce rate didn't, you know, is lower than it was before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some good indications that, yeah, the website did do well because mm -hmm. there's less people bouncing and they're staying longer. Right. But then it comes down to the conversions themselves. That's why those objectives are important because then we take some of those objectives as much as we can and try to convert those into some sort of goal inside Google Analytics, for example. Right. Just, you know, and then those individual goals are essentially being recorded um, as the site continues to to grow and evolve. Right. So if if someone's building a lead generation website, right, something that may be really easy to measure, right, is just the website's ability to generate the lead. Is the design catered to your target audience, right? Is it speaking to them? Is it convincing them that you know, your organization, your product, your service is going to fit their needs, right? So a completion of a form triggers a Google Analytic goal, right? I mean, that that's a real easy one, right? Is the website generating leads? Yes. Okay, great. You know, this has met a major objective for us. But I think some of the other ones that we found that are really hard to measure are things like uh, brand awareness, right? Like how difficult is that, um, especially from a startup perspective, if you're, you know, if we're working with a client that um, we don't work with many startups, but we work with a few and this idea of pumping marketing dollars into a website, but not being able to really measure like end to end ROI brand awareness, right? Like, yeah, you can go to your social platforms and, and look at your, your follower growth, right? You can go and look at your traffic on your website and you can see that growth. But again, a real specific, like if you set a goal that we are we want our website to build more brand awareness, that is something that's gonna be really hard to measure post-launch, right? So it's, it's thinking through kind of a balancing act of don't let that be your sole driver, your sole goal, um, but also Take in consideration what the goal is and how you're going to measure it post launch. Yep. Yep. Yeah, brand awareness is the toughest one to to try and peel out because it, it there's so many different touch points and channels that um, that one could point to and say it's working, it's working, um, and maybe it is, you know. Um, but it, I think the proof is going to be in the pudding. I'll give you an example. One of our clients, um, they make these really cool um, toys for kids, you know, STEM toys. And um, one of the things that we set out to do originally was brand awareness, right? We wanted the market to know that they existed um, and where the watering holes and places that made sense for them to go. Now, there's two ways. One, you can go to the consumer route, say, hey, consumers, guess what? This exists. It's like a Lego experience, but better. Hmm. Um, and it allows your kids to learn about STEM and put together basically building circuits. Hmm. Um, that's a cool way, or you can try and reach out to someone like Amazon, who is a better distributor or distributor of their product at this point, so that now you can actually, the brand awareness is more about trying to convince Amazon, hmm. more so than con consumers, right? Right, Because now Amazon sees you as a viable target to then put into their STEM boxes every right. single month. So now, guess what? I'd rather sell to Amazon than I would to the consumer markets because I am hitting consumers, but through Amazon's distribution channel. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, Amazon. They are, uh, <laughs> we, we've received a number of Amazon boxes over the last 30 days. So we're recording this right after Christmas. So, um, <laughs> I am tired of breaking down Amazon boxes <laughs> for a okay. long time. Yeah. Uh, all right, Navi, well, let's wrap this up. We're, we're kind of going long here, but this is a really deep topic. And I know you, I appreciate you kind of unpacking it for us. And um, I love your idea with the three boxes. I think anybody can take that, go to a whiteboard and follow that process. I think that's brilliant. So thanks for, for everything. I appreciate it. Uh, happy New Year to you, sir. Same to you. Same to you. And thanks for letting me have uh, some time here with you today. It's good to see you again.